And once again, once again, we are recording. So if you don't want your face on the screen, turn your camera off now. Um, and uh, good morning, everyone. Again, thank you all so much for coming. We're so glad that you're here. And we are uh, we're going to get started uh, today with presentations from Randy Br Randy Beam at UNC Charlotte. Did I get that right? Okay. Uh, from Kellen Baldridge Smallwood at, from the University of Pennsylvania. And, uh, and we also have a student group joining us today, which is very exciting. Uh, so we have Jillian McKinnon, Simone, Simone Gillespie, Bell Kozabowski, and Adriana Quijano from UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, all right, Randy, take it away. Okay, thanks. All right, let me... Share my screen. Okay, great. All right. Oh, I clicked. It's like I'm a baby again during the pandemic. Okay, great. All right, awesome. All right, guys. Well, I'm Randy Beam. I'm the Instruction Archivist at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Um, and today I'm going to be giving a presentation focused on architectural drawings and menus, teaching students larger concepts through place-based education. So just to give you all an idea of how this activity came about, it really started with meeting with the professor of this class called Food Migration in Place. Her name is Colleen Hamelman and she focuses predominantly on, she's a geographer, she focuses on how food sort of connects us all together and connects us to the spaces that we're in as well as how it develops community for us and for folks coming to the city. So a great example of her research, um, she's done a lot of really great work with uh, the Latinx population here in town and how sort of once they arrived in the 1990s, they built a bunch of different interesting uh, Mexican restaurants along Central Avenue. So she talks about how like food really creates community for people. The class has been taught for the past six years and there's always a special collections visit. It is a geography course. It is 4,000 level. So that gives you an idea of if they've seen a little bit of um, primary sources, if they haven't, things along that line. And then that's our reading room right there. So Charlotte Collection Connection. Um, I love alliteration. Anyway, so our collection um, UNC Charlotte Special Collections is really built on preserving the history of Charlotte, North Carolina and surrounding areas with a collection focus on manuscript collections, rare books, maps, and government documents. We have more of a local history focus. Um, there are quite a few institutions here in town, so we sort of built this as our niche. Uh, so we do have like family papers, we have um, materials from different business leaders, things of that nature. The two major collections that I use for this activity in this course, um, <clears throat> they also do a big bell ringer with our map from 1775 of North and South Carolina. They are geography majors. They do love that. It's very exciting for them. Um, and then we do do this activity. So it comes from two different collections. So M.E. Martin Evans Boyer Jr. Papers. He was a prominent Charlotte architect. Um, and he was the architectural, uh, we use his architectural drawings and project photographs. So he actually did a renovation on the S&W cafeteria. And then the Franco Sherrill papers. So he was the owner of the S&W cafeteria in Charlotte and co-founder of the franchise. Um, I'm going to tell you my age by saying this restaurant. Um, think of Shoney's. Shoney's is uh, <laughs> the now defunct Shoney's. Um, mostly defunct. That was sort of what the S&W cafeteria, so like a regional um, type of restaurant. Uh, and then we use petitions as well as letters um, and correspondence to him from different citizens. So we use that for this activity. Now, I do want to give sort of a theory behind the lesson. Um, it's really this concept of power of place by public historians. That's where place-based education comes from. So it wasn't necessarily something that the archival field um, developed totally on their own, but it is something that we realized we were doing, which I feel like happens to us all the time. But it's nice to have these more broader um, theories utilized for our own personal praxis. 
And it's adapted for archival instruction with the use of homegrown primary sources. I was really first introduced to this concept by Carrie Beam. Um, she actually got married, so it's Carrie Beam Champion and Carrie Schweier. Uh, they are both um, at the Indi at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Carrie Schweier actually used to be my boss. I can't sing her praises enough, but this article is a really wonderful way for you to sort of get an idea of how to utilize this. They use a lot of examples um, with creative courses. So I definitely encourage folks to take a look at that. It's called Learning in Place, the Teaching Archivist in Place-Based Education. It's through... Um, archival issues from Mac. So, you know, if you want to find it, it is open access. Um, and why it works for us, the collection at Atkins Library is built around local history and the history of the university. And it really allows for us to teach larger concepts such as segregation and civic involvement, looking at one situation that occurred in the city where students are studying. So it gives them an idea. Some of our students are local students. Some of our students though are from all over North Carolina. And then we have had some, like I met a, um, a student one time who was from Fishers, Indiana. So it we while we are a regional campus, we're sort of like the biggest one or one of the bigger ones. No offense to Chapel Dome. Um, I do wanna give an idea of our lesson overview though. So learning objectives, Students will be able to explain what primary sources are and how they can reflect the time period they were created during. Now, I know this is a little bit of a lower level learning objective, but I think it's important to understand that these are geography majors and sometimes they probably have come into contact with primary sources. They just may not know how, um, how to describe them or they may not even know that they really came into contact with them. So students will analyze three different sets of primary sources to understand the connection between the creators um, of these collections and the time period they were created. So I will say we do use a few different variety of things. I know I mentioned the map, but this is sort of the meat and potatoes, if you will, of, um, of this lesson. So students receive these three sets of primary sources, the ar architectural drawings, photographs of the renovations, and these letters and petitions. The primary sources tell the story of how segregation and integration played out with the S&W cafeterias. Now, I will say, um, we had Kathleen from UNCG yesterday. The first set-in occurred, uh, in terms of the S&W cafeterias, occurred in um, Greensboro. So if you want to sort of go down that rabbit hole for your own research, I highly recommend their repository. And then there was an actual set-in that occurred here at this SNW um, with students from Johnson C. Smith University here in town, which is our historically black college um, in Charlotte. And then, like I said, the SNW cafeteria chain was throughout the South, basically from Charlotte, North Carolina to Richmond, Virginia. So a couple different examples of documents utilized. So these are from the M.E. Boyer papers. Um, you can see on here, uh, you can see that there's a white women's restroom. There's a white women's dressing room. So that's one way for students to understand, um, maybe like give them a little bit of a hint in terms of what's happening with this building and how the building connects to these letters. Um, it also gives you an idea too of how Franco Cheryl may have thought this was gonna go. Um, these renovations occurred in the 1950s, so still during this Jim Crow era type of um, South. So it's very interesting to see that. And students sort of end up picking up on it pretty quickly. And then there's photographs, like any good architect, he did, um, he did a lot of photographs of renovations that he did. And then these are from the Franco Sherrill papers. Um, he received a lot of letters from people in Charlotte. He also received a lot of letters from people in Raleigh. Uh, I will say too, he, um, all of the letters are not pro integration. A lot of them are, um, you know, very anti integration, um, pro segregation letters. I will say my favorite is this woman in the middle who says, <laughs> Please mark me up as one white patron of your cafeterias in Raleigh who will be glad if and when you can serve Negroes with the rest of us. I like that she's like, 
I've said what I needed to say. This is what you should do. This is also interesting too. I think students are used to people complaining to different companies um, in more of a digital way, right? So uh, back when Twitter was Twitter, people would complain, right, to Chipotle, I'm not getting enough. There's that huge conspiracy about how Chipotle serving sizes are smaller. Um, they know how that you would interact with a corporation or a company uh, today, but they have, a lot of them have no idea that people would just write letters to, to owners of restaurants. So it's a very interesting eye-opening experience. I also use these two. Um, I do love the architectural drawings. I like the Emmy Boyer papers for a lot of different places here in town, but it is harder to find dates on them. And the nice thing about these is that you can see clearly that these are from 1963. So I follow the Librarian, Act, Librarian Active Learning Institute principles of um, asking questions and sort of presenting them with this type of mystery, and then they understand how these resources work together. So what kind of items did you all look at? What year are your materials from? And as always, I follow up with what was going on in Charlotte or America during this time period. What are your materials talking about? And what do you think is the connection between these materials? So lastly, I just wanna cover some student reflections. It's a really great activity and it gets them, especially these students um, in particular in this course, get them to think about how like the idea of food and the idea of how we get connected to food is different for lots of different people. They do do a lot of time talking about food deserts, right? And unfortunately food deserts occur in poorer neighborhoods here in Charlotte. So it's a good way for, to get them to think about like what, what does this idea of segregation look like today, right? Gentrification, things of that nature. They also are very interested in the fact that um, unfortunately they're not really taught this in high school and there is that larger debate, right, of what do we teach in history courses in high school. But a lot of people want to give this illusion that everybody was on the side of what we would think is justice today, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, and lastly, like I said, students really enjoy this activity because it holds these different interesting pieces of history. So for instance, this Western Union telegram from um, President John F. Kennedy, and then people do, people did really complain about how he met with John F. Kennedy and he was in cahoots with John F. Kennedy. Um, so they can see where these different objects sort of connect with each other. Um, and then we see the S and W cafeteria. I also too just ask them, um, because it is a class about food, I ask them and I say, do you think this restaurant would be successful today? Do you think this is a restaurant um, that might come um, might actually be something that we would try to like recreate today. And then lastly, before I turn it over to Kellen, um, if you have any questions or thoughts, that is for the end. Um, but this is my email. If you have any um, thoughts or if you want to read the article by the, by I've been calling them the Carries in my head, but if you would like to read an article by Carrie Schweier and Carrie Beam Champion, feel free to let me know because I do, uh, I do have that link really handy. So, all right, I am going to stop sharing and then Kellen, you're good to go. So. Great, you, thank you. Why, just quickly, why don't you go ahead and put the link in the chat, Randy, and then we can. Oh yeah, like, sure. That's click on thank it you, if Jennifer. You want to. Yes, yes. All right, Kelly, take it away. Thank you, and I will say I apologize. I am not in my office right now, and my headset has decided to stop working. So I apologize for any background noise. Um, so I'm Kellen Baldridge Smallwood, and I'm a processing archivist at the University of Pennsylvania Kislak Center for Special Collections, Rare Books, and Manuscripts. Um, and in 2022, I started cataloging our modern manuscripts, which is anything after 1800. Um, and I completely fell in love with our handwritten family cookbooks in doing so, many of which are 19th century um, British and American. And so since then, I've become kind of the principal cataloger of these cookbooks at Penn. Um, and in addition to work at, like working as a processing archivist, I have cataloged a few dozen of these cookbooks at this point. Um, and so today I'd just love to discuss kind of some of what I've learned about the cookbooks and also how I describe them in our records. So before we get to the actual cookbooks, I want to talk a little bit about the discovery environment at Penn. 
um, and kind of how we describe these modern manuscripts. So there are two primary access points to special collections material at Penn, and that's the Franklin Catalog and the Philadelphia Area Archives site. Um, the Franklin Catalog is just your standard library catalog with mark records, um, and the PAA site, which is what we call it, is an aggregator that represents collections across PAC school, which is special collections repositories across the Philly area. Um, and that's in finding aids. So Franklin tends to be kind of the primary access point for books and rare books, whereas PAA is the primary access point for archival and manuscript materials. And this isn't like a hard and fast rule, it's just kind of the rule of thumb. Um, so our codices, including these cookbooks, had initially been described in DCRM MSS compliant mark records only in the Franklin catalog. But we kind of found that people were looking for this kind of material in the PAA site. Um, so we've decided to kind of catalog this material both in mark records in Franklin and finding aids in PAA. And these are just examples of records, but I found I really appreciate this approach because thinking of the 520 summary note and a mark record like a scope and contents note has really helped enrich in the description of these cookbooks and also like increase access points to them. Um, and I love being able to include a bio note um, in the finding aid, which is linked in the mark record because it gives us the freedom to really contextualize these cookbooks in a way that's just not appropriate in a mark record all the time. And so, the freedom to kind of thoroughly describe these codices makes them much more accessible. But I'd say like as an archivist, I don't have the full historic context or framework to understand how they could be used by researchers. So I really try to make like a thorough effort to describe every you know possible entry point that feels useful to me, um, which again is my judgment. Um, but I do try to be quite, get the breadth of what these cookbooks have to offer. So what I typically do as I approach one of these codices is compile all possible leads, leads and just give myself half an hour to see if anything sticks. That's literally just Googling, going through records, whatever it might be. Um, and if nothing sticks, then I move on. If not, I can kind of follow the threads further. Um, and in like the case of recipes, well, I should say, these leads typically involve names, titles, locations, and in the case of the recipe books, any recipes that sound like they might have more of a history to them. And engaging with the description of cookbooks in this way, I've come across a few common themes that I find really interesting, and I like to be sure to include in my records when they do come up. So I do want to talk about some of these themes. The first one is that these manuscript cookbooks really evidence the wide-reaching knowledge networks of women. So these clips on the screen are all from one manuscript that I just happened to be working on while I made this presentation. It's nothing special, not like a special example of this, but there are 17 references to 17 different women um, within, within the one cookbook. And this is so common across all of the cookbooks I've worked on. Um, kind of this evidence that women were sharing their recipes with one another and that cooking was like their means of connection. Um, and that cookbooks can really serve um, as evidence of how broad a woman's network was um, in the 19th century. And even when the names are largely unidentified, you know, say Mrs. Betts, um, I like to include the names of women referenced in the volume in my description. Um, I do this both because it really provides that obvious evidence of kind of the knowledge networks, but also because I find that they could serve as the missing piece of a puzzle um, somewhere else. And I've actually had this happen in a cookbook before where I gave a name and then later on cataloged a cookbook that seemed completely disconnected. And I was actually able to connect the two and complete the name that I had in the first cookbook. Um, so the second theme is that I think this is kind of a long theme that I have on the screen. I basically mean um, that these cookbooks can serve as evidence of how British imperialism trickled down into the lives and in the case of cookbooks, kitchens of normal people, which I love kind of seeing this bigger history picture and how it manifested in the lives of normal people. And one of my favorite examples of this is mock turtle soup. You see several examples of mock turtle soup up on the screen. There are so many more that I've come across. It's not something I want to eat, 
Um, but I'd say any Gilmore girls fans out there uh, might remember this as Richard's only source of comfort after his mom died. Um, it was a popular 18th century, um, well, based on the popular 18th century sur- turtle soup recipe, um, which uh, that came about after the green turtle was hunted to near extinction. Um, and turtle soup was popularized as British soldiers brought green turtles back from the West Indies. Um, they hunted them to near extinction by the 19th century and mock turtle soup came about uh, as a result. And I think it's such an apt example of kind of how British imperialism worked. They funneled the foreign research sources into England, depleted the local resources, and then how this kind of like sucking up of resources trickled down into, you know, the homes of regular people. And mock turtle soup is not the only example of this. Come across recipes for things like sago pudding and mulligatawny soup very frequently, which kind of have the same story. And the third theme is my favorite. And it's that kind of engaging with the description of these cookbooks can provide a reemergence of the names and stories of the women who wrote them. And these are three examples that I don't actually think I'm going to have time to talk about, but I do encourage people to seek out the finding aids if they're interested. Um, But I'll dig in more to this one. This is the cookbook of Eliza Dwight Pierce, um, only identified in the actual volume as Mrs. John Pierce of Greenfield, Massachusetts. Um, And it serves as a wonderful example of the previous themes um, and also how these cookbooks can serve to reintroduce these women's stories. And so as common um, as it was, it was common um, that this cookbook was initially identified only by the creator's husband's name, but by researching the names of other women identified in this volume actually led me back to Eliza's full name. So you can see kind of in the right-hand photo, I think our I'm blocking it in my own view, but at the bottom, it's hard to read, but there's a caption saying, these are recipes I had in the Sierra Nevada mountains of the Central Pacific Railroad Survey made by T.D. Judah in 1861, signed Anna Judah. So researching the name um, provided in that, as well as Central Pacific Railroad Survey, led to the discovery that Theodore Judah was a well-known civil engineer known as a central figure in the development of several American railways and that he was married to a woman named Anna Judah, whose maiden name was Pierce, and was the daughter of John Pierce, and more importantly, Eliza Dwight Pierce, who was born in Gill, Massachusetts, and lived in Greenfield. From there, I learned that Eliza raised three children on a farm, all three of whom came back to live there as adults, some with children of their own. And knowing that her husband and two sons were farm workers, and there was a full house, including adult children, grandchildren, domestic workers, really brings this cookbook to life. And I actually baked one of the recipes out of this cookbook and it was just like an enormous amount of cake. It was so big. There was such a volume of batter um, that it really kind of brought it to life knowing that she'd be feeding all of these people. So this kind of leads back to the theme um, of this network of women. And Eliza's cookbook is such a good example of this. Hers credits numerous women, including full names that we have for people like Anna Judah, Clara Roots, Ruth Hubbard, Maria Judah, Martha Phelps, and Fanny Flint from across the United States. Um, That's Boston to Erie, Pennsylvania, to Akron, Ohio, and some California. Um, And kind of on top of that, there are dozens of other partially identified women and dozens of letters that don't have kind of any identifications with them, but evidence the breaths of this network. And I don't think I'm actually going to have time to talk about this, but I find these cookbooks really show how women engaged with media um, and kind of what they had in their own like media environment. But I think that's probably I have ta- all I have time for, even though I could talk about these forever. Um, but here's my email. And I hope this has been kind of interesting and thinking about how to just approach the description of manuscript cookbooks and feel free to reach out if you have any questions or want to geek out about manuscript cookbooks. Right. And that's it for me. Jillian and company, take it away. Thank you.
Um, so I'm just going to wait for to be in present mode so you all can see everything. Um, thank you to both of the previous presenters. Those were really interesting presentations. Um, so my name is Belle Kozabowski. I'm joined by my fellow researchers, Jillian McKinnon, Simone Gillespie, and Adriana Quijano. Um, and we're going to be talking about a digital exhibit that we curated, researched, and arranged um, called Recipes Resurrected, uh, North Carolina Culinary Treasures from the Archives. Um, we did this with the help of Dr. Elliot Keeker, who is an associate professor um, at UNC's SILS program, and Sarah Carrier, who is the North Carolina Research and Instruction Librarian at Wilson. We can go to the next slide. Um, so just to give y'all a little bit of context, um, we all, all of our group just recently graduated a month ago um, with our master's in library science. Um, and as part of fulfilling our, our master's, we either can do a practicum or a thesis paper. Um, and so we chose to do a practicum, which was a year long project um, and ours. Oh, thank you for all the congratulations. Um, so for ours, we focused on North Carolina foodways, which is kind of like the synthesis of some of our earlier um, research. I know for me, this is the synth synthesis of all of my research in my master's. So it's been really gratifying to, to work on. Um, and obviously a lot of um, people are really interested in foodways research and food history research just in the field in general. So we see this as being a really high research interest topic. Um, we also kind of framed our project thinking of the um, the Wilson Library closure that was supposed to happen this year. Um, they've since postponed it, so it's not really relevant anymore. But when we were originally thinking about it, we were thinking about um, planning to have things be available online when Wilson was closed. Get to the next slide. So just to talk a little bit about our scope and focus, as I've mentioned previously, um, we focus just on North Carolina and we utilized materials from Wilson Special Collections Library that's on UNC's campus. Um, we focused a lot on regionality of the food. So we looked in the Appalachian region, Piedmont region and coastal region of North Carolina. Um, and we used a really wide variety of formats. That's something that I know I'm really, really proud of with this project that we were able to use so many different things um, to kind of highlight how food and recipes can help us to understand daily life. Um, and now Adriana is gonna talk a bit more about those different formats. Awesome, so as we mentioned, uh, we focused on utilizing materials from uh, Wilson Special Collections Library. For our initial research and final scalar page, we wanted to look at a broad selection of library materials uh, focused on our individual regions. So here we have an example of a community cookbook from our Piedmont region um, from 1974. This one is titled Calico Cupboard Church Cookbook. It was collected by Brickhead United Methodist Church Women in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. We can see recipes uh, like green pepper jelly and pumpkin breads from local members. And next, we have Seafood Sorcery, another community cookbook by the Junior League of Wilmington, North Carolina from 1969. Uh, the focus is more content specific here, focusing on recipes, including seafood, such as shrimp and clam fritters. Uh, specific cookbooks like this really highlight regionality and were popular in the coastal plain. They helped identify key ingredients across regions and really work to inform writing our scalar pages. Um, and next we have, uh, we also looked at earlier examples of manuscript cookbooks. This source example shows recipes from Martha Cowell's personal recipe book from Elkville, North Carolina from, 19, er, from 1846. A recipe shown here include federal cakes and donuts. Often these gave us insight into agriculture and popular crops, especially in the Piedmont region. And next, we also dedicated a scalar page to food-related advertisements across North Carolina, which will be discussed in more depth a little later. But these um, were found in city directories, newspapers, um, farmers' alamances, and yearbooks. Uh, these ads showcase products like grocery stores, community-wide fish fries, bakeries, restaurants, kitchen appliances, and so much more. Um, we examine these advertisements throughout time, showcasing how they have evolved and advanced in North Carolina. And lastly, we utilized the Durwood Barber Collection of North Carolina postcards from the photographic archives. Uh, these various postcards supplemented our research perfectly by 
by providing visuals of storefronts and restaurant fronts, as well as everyday scenes of coastlines and people across North Carolina. And we found this was a really great way to put relevant visuals on our scalar pages. Awesome, thank you, Adriana. So as Adriana was talking, she was mentioning scalar. Um, Jillian put a link in the chat. If you guys want to, please feel free to kind of like click through that scalar page as we're chatting about it. Um, it's a, it's kind of hard to like put it all up on a screen on a, on a presentation. So we wanna invite you to please look at that on your own as we're talking. Um, so to publish our um, digital exhibit, we use Scalar. And if you're not familiar, it's a free open source publishing platform um, where you can assemble media from a bunch of different sources um, and have collaborative authoring. So it's kind of like a WordPress site, but a little bit more intensive. Um, that was that was how we decided to publish our exhibit. But when we were crafting our exhibit, we did a lot of both collaborative and independent research. So we were lucky enough to work with Sarah Carrier, who works a lot with the North Carolina collection at Wilson. Um, and she put together some group sessions for us um, to come in and look at materials. But we also went into, into Wilson and had um, meetings in the research room independently. Um, and so, we can go on to the next slide to talk a little bit more about our exhibit design. Um, so we really thought very deeply about how we wanted to design our digital exhibit. And we had a lot of conversations about how we wanted to kind of like structure things because there's so many ways to do it. Um, and if you're not familiar with Scalar, usually it is kind of set up as like a little book. Um, and so we wanted to make it a little bit of like a cookbook. Um, and so we focused on um, regionality, as I mentioned earlier. So we had a section for um, coastal North Carolina, the Piedmont region, North Carolina, and Western North Carolina. Um, and once we decided on regionality, we did independent research with primary sources, as well as secondary sources um, that you can see listed here. So just to read out the names of each of our independent research um, Adriana worked on fishing, an introduction to coastal Carolina. Um, Jillian worked on agriculture and Piedmont foodways. And I worked on tourism and food in Western North Carolina. Um, and then Simone is gonna talk about her section. So I focused on advertising for our final selection. Um, it's through time and taste advertising North Carolina foods. Um, we picked this as a, a fourth research option as a great way to support the focus on the three other regions while also having plenty of materials to conduct its own um, vein of research. On the right here, you'll see the map of North Carolina that we um, created using the metadata we included with each uploaded item. Um, so users, on our scaler can zoom in and out and focus on different parts of the state to see what we found from each area. You can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, again, with the help of our metadata we included, um, we were able to build this interactive timeline of the advertising that we found. Um, so users can scroll through time and see the evolution of North Carolina food advertising. Um, so we presented this project at the Symposium on Information for Social Good, which is UNC's School of Information and Library Sciences annual symposium to showcase students' work. Um, and we had the pleasure of presenting our exhibit and our poster at this year's symposium this past April. Here we're seen pictured with our faculty sponsor, Dr. Elliot Keeker. And we really felt that it was important to have takeaways with our poster session. So Belle baked um, an apple cornbread recipe that she found during her research of Western North Carolina. Um, I brought in cheer wine to wash it down with. And we each selected two recipes that we included on recipe cards for everyone to take home. Um, finally, for future considerations for our project, um, this project has been approved for the 24-25 practicum year. Um, so there will be a team of other UNC SIL students that will continue researching and building upon this project that we started. 
With the continuation of the project, we hope to see the expansion of research focus. Um, throughout our research, we noted um, that there are so many avenues that we hope to research, but simply did not have the time to do so. And those researchers will continue on those pathways. Um, we hope to share this project with as many people as possible through conference presentations such as this one and possible future publications. And finally, after our close work with Wilson Special Collections Library at UNC, we hope to collaborate further with them in the future, especially in regards to publicizing and growing this exhibit and its research. This concludes our presentation today. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, our contact information is here as well as in our bios on our scalar. Please feel free to contact us and reach out about um, any ideas you may have research-wise um, and helping us carry this on into the future. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much. Um, we're going to open it up for questions now. So you're welcome to put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask. Good morning, uh, panelists. This is Amber Scamps. I'm chiming in from uh, North Alabama. And I just wanna say, especially to the last group um, from UNC, bravo guys, that um, I'm originally a Western North Carolina, born and raised, transplanted to Alabama and hearing cheer wine this morning just made my heart sing. So excellent presentation, guys. Any other questions or comments? I have a question for our first presenter. Um, I am blanking on the name, I apologize. Um, Randy, sorry. Um, I was curious if there are other, um, which first of all, this one um, example with the geography class is amazing. And I'm curious if there are other classes that you work with or if there are any that you want to do in the future going forward. Yeah, definitely. Um, this one, I usually, there's two like larger scenarios that I use. So I got really lucky that the geography department was super responsive to me. Um, bothering them. And so they were really happy to like have me do a lot of different activities. Um, I do use this one too in another course that's focused on this introduction to planning. Um, just because the other thing is that there was an all black, um, predominantly African-American community here in Charlotte in the second ward area, which is where the NASCAR Hall of Fame is now. Um, and they were bulldozed, uh, their homes were bulldozed and the idea of like urban renewal is good. Um, so I use that scenario too. And actually the SNW cafeteria wasn't super far from the Brooklyn neighborhood. So it's interesting to give them this idea of like that different connection um, in terms of like where were places where they were not, where um, black folks were not allowed to be. So that's one thing too. I do, I have used it before in another course. We have a another professor, um, I feel like these professors make it sound like we love food here and we do, but um, she teaches a course that's really focused on this idea of um, climate refugees and how folks have moved. And that's a really interesting take too, in terms of how these businesses and how these communities have cropped up. Um, I think food is an interesting aspect of Charlotte just because a lot of Greek immigrants came into town and they ended up sort of changing the makeup of what food looked like. Uh, and it's an interesting story of like assimilation because um, to use another Carolina restaurant, Show Mars used to just be, uh, it is Greek, but it used to just be sort of more so um, uh, like actual, just like down home Southern food. So there's a lot of different interesting opportunities, but yeah, I I like the SNW cafeteria because then we do look up a menu and the kids are like, I don't even know if I would want to eat. I don't even know if I would go to the 
the um you know the trouble of trying to integrate this cafe it doesn't sound good so anyway that's a great uh point that like this food doesn't even sound good which I thought about in the um the second presentation with all the turtle soup and everything um this is something that I don't know all that much about so hopefully someone else knows more um but about a year or two ago I attended a um a symposium at Georgia Tech in Atlanta and they have students um who worked with the special collections so there's actually a site on campus that there originally had a restaurant that um I can't 